Good evening and welcome to IBA News coming to you from Jerusalem. As the massive national home front drill got underway this morning, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu sent a clear and public message to Israel's neighbors, a message of peace and stability. Joining me now from our Tel Aviv studio with more of what the Prime Minister had to say is IBA's diplomatic correspondent, Leah Zinder. Good evening, Leah. Yes, hi, Yohanan. Well, as you say, uh, at the opening of today's cabinet meeting, the Prime Minister made a point of repeating the message that has already been conveyed along direct and indirect diplomatic channels to all of Israel's neighbors, including Hezbollah. Hezbollah, by the way, which over the weekend expressed its concern, uh, real or feigned, over the true significance of the drill. Netanyahu stressed today that this is an annual routine exercise planned months in advance and was not scheduled in response to any irregular security development along the northern border or elsewhere. Quite the contrary, he said, Israel wants peace, quiet and stability. But it's no secret, he said, that we live in a region that is subject to threats of rockets and missile attacks. The best defense, said Netanyahu, is deterrence. And then in a rare move, Defense Minister Ehud Barak also spoke to the cameras at the start of the cabinet meeting, emphasizing that Israel has no intention of declaring war but must be prepared to defend itself, and he said, we are indeed well prepared. One more interesting comment today from the Prime Minister made to Likud ministers just ahead of today's cabinet meeting. Netanyahu responded to Friday's report in the Wall Street Journal that Palestinian negotiators had sent a message to Israel through George Mitchell that they're willing to swap large tracts of West Bank land with Israel as part of a peace deal. Netanyahu told the ministers, those reports are false. He said Mitchell has not yet begun mediating and is still listening to the positions of each side. Abbas, by the way, said publicly just yesterday that he is ready to give 4% of West Bank land to Israel as part of a land swap. A senior source in the Prime Minister's office told us he's deeply cynical about the sincerity of these Palestinian statements. If they were serious, he said, they'd be making their offers in negotiations with Israel, not trying to score points in the media. Back to you, Yohanan. Thanks to our diplomatic correspondent, Leah Zender. Well, as we just mentioned, Israel began a five-day civil defense drill today to test the response of soldiers, emergency crews, and civilians to a wide array of simulated attacks. This fourth annual home front drill is the biggest Israel has ever conducted. We get more now on this report. Israel's largest ever home front exercise began this morning as part of the emergency authorities' preparation for a number of possible attack scenarios. These include rocket attacks, planting of dirty bombs, and the use of hazardous material. This dress rehearsal for disaster, codenamed Turning Point 4, will simulate the firing of hundreds of missiles from different fronts. The National Emergency and Management Authority, Israel Police, Magen David Adom, the Israeli Fire Department, government offices, and municipalities are slated to take an active role in the exercise. According to defense officials, the emphasis of this year's exercise will be on the response of local authorities to a military emergency. Drills will be held in 68 cities and towns that are home to about 70 percent of Israel's population. Said a senior defense official, these types of exercises will not only reduce the number of Israeli casualties in the next conflict, they may determine the conflict's outcome. During the drill, emergency units and municipalities will also simulate the derailing of a train in Hadera, a rocket attack on the Haifa area, an incident involving hazardous material at Haifa's port, a water shortage at Kfar Shmayo, the planting of a dirty bomb at a Jerusalem school, and an attack on military facilities in Beit Lid. The main scenario for the police will be a strike on Beersheba by missiles fitted with chemical warheads. Eight communities will practice the speedy distribution of gas masks, and for the first time, Israel will test its response to a blow to its computer and electronic communications infrastructure after a cyber attack. The biggest part of the exercise nationwide will come Wednesday when sirens will sound across the country at 11 a.m., at which time all residents are expected to go to bomb shelters or other protected spaces. Drills will also be held in schools. The IDF has stressed that the exercise is being conducted as part of the usual security preparations in the country and that the date for the drill was set at the beginning of the year. Ellie Wogelanter, IBA News. The home front drill has generated criticism with Israel's neighbor to the north, Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Hariri, meeting today with visiting French Foreign Minister Bernard Kushner, complained that Israel's decision to stage a week of military exercises runs counter to peace efforts, adding, how can you launch negotiations with Palestinians while holding military maneuvers? 
Hariri is scheduled to travel to Washington later today for his first visit to the Obama White House as premier. Meanwhile, in response to the Israeli exercise, the Hezbollah terror group today mobilized thousands of its fighters in southern Lebanon. The massive fire that broke out in a metal processing plant south of Akko yesterday was finally contained early this morning after raging for nearly 24 hours. The blaze began around 11 a.m. at the Hod Pladot recycling plant, and within hours, plumes of thick smoke covered the region. More in this report. Initially, eight firefighting teams were called to the scene, but after hours of unsuccessful attempts to stifle the blaze, 12 additional brigades had to be deployed. Firefighting officials said the actual flames posed no threat to people or property. However, many fear the plant's waste collection area was emitting harmful fumes. A hazardous materials treatment patrol from the Environmental Protection Ministry arrived at the scene to monitor the situation. Director General of the Ministry, Yossi Enbar, used caution by instructing nearby residents to stay inside while testing was done to measure the toxins in the air. These are just safety precautions we are taking, he said. There's no need for major concerns. By the afternoon, however, experts declared the air non-hazardous, despite the toxic substances being burned, stating that the smoke stayed high enough in the atmosphere that it was safe for people to resume normal activities. Despite reassurances from authorities, people still aren't convinced that this incident will not have repercussions or negative side effects. It is still unclear how the stacks of metal goods stored in the factory caught fire, but Environmental Protection Minister Gilad Erdan ordered a criminal investigation to determine the cause of the fire and who, if anyone, should be held accountable. Reporting for IVA News, Farah Cardelli. And joining me now from our Tel Aviv studio to discuss the damage caused by the Akko fire is Tzipi Isser Itzik, the director of Adam Teva Vadin, the Israel Union for Environmental Defense. Tzipi, thanks so much for coming in this evening. Good evening. The blaze at the recycling facility blanketed entire communities in a thick cloud of smoke for a while. Residents were ordered to remain indoors. How dangerous was that situation for residents? It's very dangerous. The, res the residents uh, around uh, this uh, industry uh, already know uh, such uh, fires uh, before. It's not the first time. It's a uh, very dangerous uh, pollutants coming out of the pipes of this plant. And you know, uh, when you have such a plant so near, so close to a residential area, it's a huge problem in Israel. In Israel. I know that uh, in other countries, in Europe, for example, uh, there are uh, industries near uh, residents, but there are uh, more uh, enforcement tools, more uh, inspections. The standards are more severe than uh, we have here in Israel. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's not the right situation to have such an uh, industry in so close to uh, houses of uh, people. Well, of course, the investigation is still underway. But from your perspective and what you know now, who's to blame for the damages to the environment? I don't know who's uh, to blame, but I know that such uh, accidents uh, should not happen. Uh, we have uh, a very huge luck that uh, it finished uh, with uh, no uh, harm to, uh, to lives of people. Uh, I think that uh, such incidents uh, shouldn't happen uh, with so close a distance to, uh, to residential areas, and I think uh, uh, the national uh, uh, government uh, should think about uh, how, uh, how to handle such uh, plants, and uh, maybe uh, they should think about uh, uh, getting them uh, away from uh, residential areas because uh, it's a, a big, big dangerous uh, situation uh, that, that we have such a fire and so many uh, pollutants uh, around there. Area residents have complained over the years that the factory has caused higher than average cancer rates in the area, particularly lung cancer. Has that been verified to your knowledge by a medical study? Of course, of course. Uh, particulate matters are uh, causing to a uh, cancer, to a uh, lung disease. Uh, it's known all over the world. It's not something new. Uh, we cannot uh, put the link between specific uh, accident uh, incident to uh, to specific uh, disease. But uh, the, the research, the medical research, uh, indicates a linkage between pollutants and respira respiratory diseases coming when we, we uh, uh, have this uh, air pollute, uh, pollution around the uh, people. So absolutely, it's, uh, it's a danger to, to our lungs. Haifa Bay, of course, is a problem area. Are there plans for moving the potentially dangerous factories in that area to 
less populated areas, or is that not feasible? I think uh, the government should consider moving such plants uh, far away from residential areas, although it's not a solution. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, the, only the situation that we have here because we have uh, not enough tools, not enough budget uh, in Israel for uh, um, um, environmental uh, um, enforcement. There are not enough uh, inspections, there are not, not enough inspectors, there's not, not, not enough uh, manpower in the Ministry of Environment to, uh, to prevent such uh, incidents. And that's why I think uh, the government should think about a, a plan to move such uh, dangerous plants uh, far away from uh, residential areas. Absolutely. Tsipi Yasser Itzik, Director of the U.S.-Royal Union for Environmental Defense, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you and good evening. In other news, convicted nuclear spy Mordechai Vanunu is back in prison six years after completing his 18-year sentence. Vanunu will serve a three-month jail term this time for refusal to do community service after being found guilty of having contact with foreign agents in 2007. Entering the Jerusalem District Court, Vanunu told reporters that he will pay a price for protecting his freedom of expression. He then went on to chastise all the groups he blames for his return to prison due to their action or inaction. Shame on you, PPC. Shame on you, Israel. Very stupid spy, Mossad, Shabak, for putting me back in prison after 24 years for speaking the truth. Shame on you, Israel media, stupid spy. Aares, idiot, haronot, ma'ariv, for self-deception. Shame on you, Israel democracy, Knesset, Bet Knesset, synagogue democracy, for not learning in 2,000 years that the basic right in democracy is freedom of speech. Shame on you, all the world media, BBC, PPC, CNN, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, Sky, Herat Tribune, New York Times, all the world media, NRK, NHK, Star, GDF, 24 France, Al Jazeera, Sunday Times for let such case happening and not protecting freedom of speech. Well, returning now to the civil defense drill, and I'm joined here in the studio by Colonel Gili Shinhar from the IDF Home Front Command. Colonel Shinhar, thanks for coming in this evening. This uh, civil defense exercise is sort of a dress rehearsal, God forbid, for, you know, a real disaster. Realistically, how much does an exercise like this uh, prepare emergency services personnel? It's very important for us uh, to uh, prepare our, our drills, to do these drills and to prepare because uh, we learned in 2006 that uh, we must be mo mo more and better prepared in the homeland and we, didn't, we haven't been s very good prepared in 2006. We learned all the lessons and we are preparing this very big drill. It's the fourth year doing this uh, kind of uh, drill. And it's a drill that it's not only for the Home Front Command, but many organizations are doing it with us, include the local authorities, which are so important. Is uh, the focus on military action, wars, uh, terrorist attacks, or are you also using this drill to address um, natural disasters, for example, maybe earthquakes or something like that? This, is dr this drill is the scenario for war, and uh, there, uh, these are the scenarios that we are uh, handling. Most of them are... Um, kinds of missiles like surface-to-surface -surface missiles or rockets uh, which we have to handle that could be conventional or non-conventional warheads. Of course, uh, in a real attack there always has uh, that element of uh, panic on the part of the civilian population. How do you factor that into your equation? First of all, we believe if the population prepare themselves in advance, there won't, won't be panic. And population is, uh, understands the threats and prepare themselves where we will. Uh, that means that the population has to understand what they have to do, how to prepare. For example, there is this leaflet that every uh, citizen that will take a gas mask uh, that we are delivering these days will get this, uh, this leaflet, and he has all the information how to prepare his family. He can look in the, in the website and also get all the information how to prepare for crisis time. So it's very important to prepare in advance and when you prepare in advance, you won't see kind of uh, uh, panic. Wednesday, of course, is the public's turn to really take part in this when the siren will sound and people should 
go to the nearest uh, fallout shelters or, or public bomb shelters. Uh, how was the response during the last drill with regard to the public? In our point of view, it was very high. It was around 45% uh, of the population, which, which was a very high percentage. This year, we are ex expecting also the same percentage, maybe a little more. Although we ask the people that are at house or in work to enter the, uh, the protective area. But if you are now driving the car, so continue driving the car and, and take care of not to doing any, ex any uh, accidents or something like that. So if, if entering the, uh, the area that we are asking to enter is causing a very big trouble, don't do it. But all the other, please try, find where is your uh, sealed room, where is the uh, shelter, and prepare the shelter, and exercise it for 10 minutes, and we'll be pre much more prepared for the future. Of course, at any given time, Israel is always uh, hosting a lot of tourists from overseas. Any advice to the tourists? Do they just uh, continue on as is, or should they try to participate some way? No, they have to continue their normal uh, visit over here. And nothing is uh, concerning them. They can see what is, how is Israel preparing for a, a wartime scenario, but they can enjoy Israel. It's sunny and nice in Israel. Colonel Gili Shenhar from the IDF Home Front Command, thank you so much for coming in this evening. Shula Zakhan was back in court today, this time over the tax authority affair. The Jerusalem District Court began the testimony stage of the trial, where Zakhan is suspected of serving as an intermediary in a bribery scheme by helping her brother, Yoram Karashi, in advancing his personal interest in the authority. The one-time bureau chief of former Prime Minister Ayod Omert has pled not guilty. In his opening argument, the prosecutor accused Zakhan with misusing her position in public office in a blatant manner and in violation of public trust and integrity. The case dates back to 2005, when Eitan Rove resigned as head of the tax authority. Jackie Matza expressed interest in getting that job, According to the prosecution, Matza sent an associate to meet with Karashi to get him to use his influence with Zakhan, who in turn would gain Omert's backing. Matza was eventually appointed to the post, and Karashi associates were appointed to top positions in the tax authority. Murder in the industrial part of Caesarea, the body of a 25-year-old guard from Hadera, was discovered early this morning. He was found dead at the entrance to the Lapidot Pharmaceutical Company, and authorities said the victim had been shot in the back. Police have launched an investigation and have not ruled out the possibility that the murder was nationalistic motivated. The court has imposed a gag order on some details of the case. Turning now to the Hepziba affair, the high court today rejected an appeal by the former director of the Hepziba building company, Boaz Yona, to receive a prison furlough. Yona has served 33 months of his seven-year sentence, but the prison authority has turned down his appeal for a leave from prison because they consider him to be a flight risk. The judge accepted the state's position and said he will review the case again in one month's time. Three Turkish cargo vessels are sailing to Greece to join six other ships to form a nine-ship so-called Freedom Flotilla with aid destined for the Gaza Strip. The extreme left-wing Israeli group Gush Shalom has urged the government not to interfere with the aid effort. However, Defense Minister Ehud Barak has instructed the Israeli Navy to intercept the convoy. The flotilla hopes to dock at Gaza City sometime on Thursday. The United Nations released a report today claiming that most of the property and infrastructure in Gaza that was damaged in last year's IDF war against Hamas is still unrepaired. The report said the blockade imposed by Israel and Egypt has hampered international aid donors from assisting in rebuilding the war-shattered territory. Muslim fundamentalists today vandalized and badly damaged a UN-run summer camp in Gaza. According to UNRWA Director John Ging, dozens of mass gunmen took part in the attack on the facility that provides recreation for children and teenagers on the Gaza shore. The attackers tied up a guard and then proceeded to burn tents and vandalize other property. The attackers left behind three bullets and a note threatening to kill Ging and others unless the UN cancels its activities for some 250,000 Gazan children. Ging said the UN has no plans to cancel the summer camp. Very disappointed about the attack on this location last night. I reassure the children firstly and their parents that UNRWA will not be intimidated by these actions. We will 
uh, repair the situation here and we will prepare ourselves to provide an excellent summer games program for all the children here in Gaza because that's what they deserve. In Cairo, the Israeli-Palestinian peace process was at the top of the agenda as visiting German Foreign Minister Guido Westerwell held talks with Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak. Earlier, the German diplomat met with Amr Musa, head of the Arab League, and Foreign Minister Ahmed Abul Reik. Westerwell said he hoped the indirect talks now taking place between Israel and the Palestinians would be successful, but he also stressed the need to pursue direct negotiations. Westerwell praised Egypt's role in trying to broker a reconciliation between the Hamas and Fatah factions, saying it would lead to more stability in the region. Mubarak also met with Spanish Foreign Minister Miguel Moratinos today, whose country holds the rotating European Union presidency. The Spanish diplomat believes the proximity talks between Israel and the Palestinians are moving in a positive manner. Earlier, Moratinos was in Jordan where he said the people of the region cannot wait forever for Israel and the Palestinians to make a comprehensive peace agreement. Jordanian Foreign Minister Nasser Jadeh urged Israel and the Palestinians to refrain from taking any actions that would jeopardize the peace process. Well, ahead of today's annual Salute to Israel parade in New York City, an Israeli chef cooked a world record size falafel ball. Israeli NBA player Omri Kaspi was on hand to unveil the 13 and a half kilo, 30 pound falafel. The fried ball of chickpeas had a circumference of over one meter. New York Attorney General Robert Morgenthau verified the weight and size for submission to the Guinness Book of World Records. A yearly event since 1964, hundreds of thousands of people take part in the Salute to Israel Parade, which is a, the largest regular celebration of Israel's independence held outside of the country. Stock Talk Now, share prices on the Tel Aviv Exchange edged higher on this first day of the trading week. Let's take a look at the late afternoon numbers. Partly cloudy skies tomorrow, slight rise in temperatures, but the IBA weather guy says it will still be pleasant. Here are the highs and lows. That's all for today. I'm Yochanan El Rome. Join me tomorrow at the same time on this same channel. Until then, thanks for watching. Have a great evening. Shalom from Jerusalem.